Hello and welcome to Getting Open with me, your host, Andrea Miller. I am joined today by Joanna Schroeder. We are now on our 51st episode. I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. It has been such a fun, exciting, challenging, and humbling ride bringing the show to you. Outstanding all the way. We've got some wonderful reader questions that Joanna and I are going to discuss, and I'm going to answer to the very best of my ability. So let's just get right into it. Joanna, you ready? I'm so ready. These are all things I've kind of wondered in my head, too, so I'm excited about this. And by the way, I've not seen these questions. So if anybody's watching and I look like a deer in the headlight, like, what? <laughs> Who would ask that question? I don't know. I wouldn't <laughs> ask that question. But, um, but these are the ones that the team called through to um to select for for us to attack so let's let's go for it one thing when people ask me why i work at your tango one thing i always say is is andrea started this company from her dream and she she's been building around that ever since so this is a great question as a female entrepreneur who launched her own media company in this crazy difficult landscape what inspired you to do that and what has inspired you to keep it going so ferociously? Oh, I love that question. Thank you. Um, I'll give the the like literal two minute, one minute thing that that started me. I I came as you know, Joanna. I came from a background of finance and engineering, so total media outsider. But I loved I loved all the books on love and relationships, Harville Hendricks and Pat Love and John Gray, all those from going back decades ago. And while I was in, I was sitting in class in business school, and I just thought, as I as I took stock of the crowded media landscape, and this is a long time ago, over two decades ago, what I saw that dominated and still tends to, has persisted, targeting women can be reduced down to fifty nine ways to please your man, seventeen tricky ways to get him to propose to you, just lose ten pounds and you'll be happy. And I thought, no shade on those companies, they're billion dollar businesses, but that kind of content never appealed to me, nor the women that I was close to. And I just thought, uh, as I say in my own book, uh, Radical Acceptance on the Secret to Happy Lasting Love, I was living with my then boyfriend, now husband. There were fireworks of the best and worst kind in our relationship. And it was just always fascinating to me, staying up late at night, talking to my girlfriends, reading these amazing books. Um, you know, the the triumphs and the heartache of being in love and then uh, relationships with my siblings. I didn't have kids at the time, but, um, you know, all these different relationships in, in my life, including my very best girlfriends and ultimately the relationship with myself. I've always been on a healing journey and, and trying to, you know, become the best version of myself. And I just felt like there wasn't um, anything like that. I As I, I would go on to say, there was a lot of white space in the crowded media landscape around love and relationship. There was no love and relationships. There was no publication or website that was really dedicated to that. And it just, it felt like that was a big opportunity. I often think of relationships more as a horizontal, Why right? People are like, oh, it's a niche. It's like, it's not a niche. It's like, as Terry Real says, it's our biosphere, right? It's the biosphere that we we live in. And either that it's like rich in oxygen and plants and minerals, or it's kind of de- Completed, right? And I, I mean, I think we, we can all relate to being in that rich oxy- oxygenated biosphere and the one where it feels like, oof, the air is a little thin and smoky. I certainly can. So it was with those insights as a um, 20-something-year-old entrepreneur that I said, let me be the person that that gives um, the space to, to this Im- just critically important area of our lives. This is well before Um, all the research that we've seen out of Harvard and so forth um, that confirms most of our our own intuitions and experiences that um, how critical love and really healthy relationships are to our longevity, health, wellness, even our financial well-being. Like like think about all the things that have changed. Think about all the things that have changed since you started. Like all of the data we have now about loneliness, about connection, about the longevity of of relationships being so important for our even our physical well-being it's almost like you had a sense of like we need to take this relationship dating connection stuff deeper and i think that's why your tango is still in business but yeah no you're but you're exactly right and that's and that's what i mean listen i have it's all this business is 
quite literally brought me to my knees, like blood, sweat, and tears. I've got the entrepreneur story that maxed on my credit cards, barred against my 401k, didn't fill out the form right. So I didn't, when I returned the money, it wasn't recorded correctly. So I got into trouble with the IRS because I didn't fill out the stupid form right. I mean, just on and on and on. I mean, I, I didn't, um, I didn't take a maternity leave with either kids. I didn't go on a honeymoon. Like it has been full throttle all in because I've believed so passionately in this business. And if I'm being honest, and this is the, I guess, good news, bad news for me, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of us that feel like we need to prove ourselves, the the lengths that we will go to, to prove ourselves, right? Now, thankfully, I, I feel like I'm I'm mostly on the other side, right? I'm like, okay, I've, I've, I've done some really wonderful things and that's not, you know, doesn't define my, you know, the the value of me, but it it has been both. I mean, if I'm being honest, and and that's the whole point of the show, um, getting open, is yes, I have always believed firmly in the importance of love and really, you know healthy relationships in our lives. I I am gonna say, I was prescient because now it feels like it's so much more with the data. To your point, I mean, and it's it's not even just out of Harvard. It's like out of Cleveland Clinic oh, with the everywhere. cardiologist. Yeah, I mean, oncologists will tell you. Um, that that cancer treatments, um, the outcomes are so much better for people that are in um, healthy relationships and they have those family and friend support systems. And so from everywhere you look, the data is really evident. And yet, to your point about the loneliness epidemic, and yet people are suffering in many ways more than ever between their, you know, the connections they have in their lives and then, you know, mental health. And those two are really inextricable. It's like they're different sides of the same coin, if you ask me. And so it I'm feels like about- we should be more connected instead of less connected. But it's good that you're kind of addressing that. But let me ask you a question about that entrepreneurship. So you were saying you didn't take maturity leaves when you had the boys. You didn't take a honeymoon. Looking back and everything we've been working on together in the process of this podcast and the stuff we talk about as friends and colleagues, do you think you needed to do that? Or do you think that was just you were in that cycle of achievement? Like, did you really not need to take a maternity leave or could you have done it differently? And if you had to do it right now, would you do it differently? Oh, I well, I totally do it differently now. I mean, now I, again, I've grown so much I, I mean so much wiser and healthier in um in my own sense of self-worth i mean fear i'm not gonna lie fear and fear of failure drove me like nothing for a very very long time it was the fear would have been death to me right and so what do you do if you're i mean you know like if you if you're afraid of dying what do you do you know fight or flight <laughs> Right. And so for me, it was just fight, fight, fight. And, and yes, of course, again, I, I believed in it passionately, but we have a, uh, a number of angel investors. I always say I'm part of the 97 percent of women that failed to raise venture capital, despite having, as many investors have told me, um, one of the best, most thorough business plans. But it's an unfair playing field. And I don't mean to sound whiny. If anything, not raising venture capital has enabled us, I think, to thrive where yep. as an independent it gave us publisher, freedom. Yeah, and 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 caused us to be really facilitated a a huge amount of scrappiness and creativity. And I just, oh my gosh, if I had the time, I'd name every single person on our team and many who have gone on to other places. But it's been just ama- the amazing people that have believed in our mission, have been willing to get behind me, deal with you know the mistakes and the and the uncertainty of being you know like I always say, we're creating something out of nothing, and that's hard and it's scary for a lot of people. Um, and so we faced a lot of headwinds, a, a lot of heartache, and and yet here we are triumphing. But it, it, it was in that really that profound need to prove myself coupled with wanting to build something brilliant that made a positive impact on the world. Those two, like both like playing, I was playing offense and defense at the same time. <laughs> well, you, we, you taught me the best term that describes both of us, the triple A Aries. First, for the listeners, what do we mean by that? And second, just to underline what you just said, there's nothing more unstoppable than a AAA Aries who has a mission to make the world better. Like, I think when you've got a mission like that, that's both personal and global, it's like, watch out. But but remind us what AAA Aries stands for. And like, how can, (laughs) if you're like one of us, like, what are the signs of that in yourself? 
Oh, my God. Um, well, so, you know, you always hear people that are type A. So because I'm type AAA and an Aries, it's like type A is not enough. You got to be like AAA, right? Times three. And then Aries, like you can be type A and be a lot of other star signs. But when you're in Aries, I mean, it's like it's like just a whole multiplying effect. And so for me, for you, for a handful of the other brilliant Aries sisters on our teams, on our team, it's that that feeling of just this is what this is what is happening. I know it in my heart. It has to happen. It's a sense of inevitability. And you often, I mean, we're at the head of the um, Zodiac, um, the head of the Zodiac. What do you call it? Like Zodiac, head of the Zodiac. I, I don't know. I think head of the Zodiac works Head of the me. Zodiac. And it, and we're rams, right? I mean, like quite literally the shape of the ram is, is to bang your head, plow forward. And, um, and that's what people like you and me and other triple type triple a Aries do I mean despite you know and let's face it sometimes it's painful and exhausting but um but when I think you can temper that like you, you just give yourself just a little more grace create that space and I've been doing these amazing super deep meditations just a ton of work where when I give myself that chance to pause that's where the power is because I mean of course I've got a lot of energy I've got a, a lot of enthusiasm and so forth that untempered can ruffle some feathers and and be exhausting when I take that pause just be a give a little grace to myself as well as well as the others around me just be a little more conscientious then then that's really where the magic happens well and another a that is in our triple a list is achievement junkie and you don't know you're an achievement junkie right away. You think you're driven and successful and you've got the secret, right? So what does it mean to you to be not just achievement oriented, not just driven, but an achievement junkie? Like where do we cross that line? Yeah, no, that's, I, I mean, touche. That is very much to me the um, um, symptom of feeling not enough, feeling not important, um, and feeling like the the antidote to those feelings are to achieve and achieve and achieve and to people please and to create and to achieve some more. And so, yes, uh, when I think about, no question, I have so much passion and belief in what we're doing. And at the same time, I also was motivated to achieve and not even just in, in my business. I mean, there, there are a number of things that I've been fortunate to succeed in. And um, and while I'm proud of those things, I also know that there's a shadow side that's driven a lot of that achievement, like coming from lack. So my, you know, really where I am now as a human being, as a as a mom, as a business leader, daughter, you know, all the relationships that I'm in, I really try to come from a place of abundance. So it's going to something, you know, wanting to create, wanting to build beautiful relationships, have incredible interviews and so forth um, for not to replace lack, but to create abundance and to channel like, oh, wow, if this can reach other people. I've been so fortunate with the the generosity and I've got great teachers and people around me that have helped me so much. Now it's like, all right, let me get back to that rather than trying to fill a hole in my being. So it's been good to, I always say kind of crossing that, um, feels good to cross that river. Did you have a moment in that process, like one particular moment where you went, none of this is filling me up. Like I have it all. I had it with my book where all of a sudden I had this book contract and it was going to happen and I wrote it and I was like almost there and I went like, oh, uh, uh, I am still not happy right now. Mm -hmm. Did you have a moment to, like it's that? It's exhausting to write a book when you have three kids and a well, job and all the stuff. It's, and I'll have and you know what? And it's not going to solve this stuff. Yeah. Did you have one of those moments okay. or was it more of well, a gradual what, understanding? I, I I mean, the kind of yes and no, but I just want to address this. I mean, so when I think about being an achievement junkie, I mean, for me, it really is. I think of myself as an addict and I want to be careful because alcoholism and um, and drug addiction, you know, the less than zero stuff. I've experienced it from people that I'm very, very close to have died. Um, so I, I want to, I say this so carefully and so as, as conscientiously as I can. I mean, deadly eating disorders, I have lived uh, close to people that have, that have gone through that. For me, 
it became, you know, that achievement, um, that drive, that achievement addiction really was workaholism. And I realized if somebody's sitting there reading the, um, uh, what is it, the the DMS-7 or whatever it's called, I should know that name, but I-, I DSM. Yeah. DSM, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you were close. You know, I don't, some people may say, listen, workaholism isn't a real addiction. And I, fine. My point is anything that you do in the extreme where you're seeking to fill a void from outside of you and you can never fill the void from outside of you. So to answer your question, I tried, as my grandfather would say, like the Dickens for decades. And again, I achieve, I mean, black belt and karate and I'm a pilot and, you know, have an engineering degree and an MBA from a, you know, Ivy League school. Like she's a Renaissance a of, woman. Uh, I'm a Renaissance woman, you know, wrote a <laughs> book that I believe in that was um, published by Simon and Schuster. I mean, just a lot. And, um, and I'm, and all the, those things I love, I, I, you know, it wouldn't be accurate to say I just did them to, to achieve. I did them because I, I love them. Um, but it was also like never enough. So to your point, never enough, never enough, never enough. And so it's been a series of um, experiences where I am now like, oh, it is enough. I am full. I am whole. And I'll tell you with so much joy and gratitude, the probably the thing that has really put me over the top in the best way possible. I promise I'm not a paid spokesperson. I am just a super fan student of Joe Dispenza's. I did a week-long deep meditation retreat, his advanced meditation course um, in Denver for a week this summer. Uh, 30, I think it was 35 hours of meditation. And it's like I took all the things that I've learned from brilliant teachers, um, uh, Byron Katie and um, Marian Williamson and Wayne Dyer and Ram Dass. And, I mean, just like all of them. I mean, Harville Hendricks, like blah, 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 Stan Tackett, all of them, all of them, all of them. You know, just like really have learned so much, both in sort of developing my own self as well as, you know, improving in my relationships. And uh, I mean, Shafali, it's like the list goes on and on. And so it was like, great, like I'm in a great place, like better and better and better. And by the way, I, it, am I perfect? No, I am not perfect. Let me just be clear. I continue to very much be a student on a path. But doing this kind of deep meditation where we're getting into, you know, I don't want to sound too geeked out here, but like heart coherence where my nervous system has calmed and and it's enabled me to just feel a sense of wholeness. And every single day since um, being on that retreat, I've done the deep meditation and that I mean, and I I've done I'll say this, I've done meditation on and off over the years Um it's like they say, like, if you know, you know, now I know. And I'm so intentional about emphasizing this because I feel like the meditation industry has done a terrible job of marketing meditation. So, And if you do certain meditations, it's hard. You think, I'm not supposed to be thinking these thoughts. I'm thinking the thoughts. Now I don't know how to meditate. Now I'm judging myself. And it falls apart. And you never want to do it again. And that was me. It was like, this isn't, this is hard. Like, I'm, I am driving myself. It's hard because you can't do it right. If, yeah, you, if and there's I'm driving, a right way to do it and you're like us, you're not going to do it. Well, it totally. And I'm driving myself so hard every freaking day. If it's like I'm giving myself one more thing to struggle with, thanks, I'm out. This thing that's supposed to be good for me that I don't enjoy even kind of, thanks, I'm out. So I say this for, for everybody listening. If you haven't found a meditation practice that you like or love, Oh my gosh, please don't give up. Joe Dispenza is great. There are others, right? I mean, there are other brilliant. In fact, I was just chatting with one of my friends. Like there are so many great breathing courses and meditation courses. But if you're like, I can't meditate, I just beseech you to try some of Joe's or try some of the other ones with the, and guided, right? I, yeah, keep what trying. I would do, yeah, I would do like the mantra, you know, my mantra, my mantra, my mantra, my mind is going, it's so boring. And I'm just like, this is like, ah, oh, it's just hard. Like, I feel like I'm doing, giving myself one more hard thing to do. So doing a deep meditation practice, like sincerely calming my nervous system, sincerely like feeling that sense of wholeness. And, you know, and it's not five minutes. I mean, I I know a lot of, by the way, if you can start with a minute or five minutes, start there. But like anything, you know, to me, I have gotten way disproportionate dividends by doing more of it. Now for especially working parents who are like, Hey, sister, I don't even have time to shower. I get you. I hear you. I don't, I mean, I will say I, there are a bunch of things I give up. Um, I don't watch TV. 
I, you know, I'm very, very um, economical with how I spend my time socially and so forth. I mean, we all have to make trade-offs, but now a trade-off I won't make every single day I meditate because that oh, yeah, makes good. my life so much better. Sorry, so, that was a long answer. Oh, no, it's okay. So one of the things that makes it so challenging to, to be doing it all is that we have kids, both of us. You have two sons. They are, remind me of the ages. Oh, Alexander is 11 and Nicholas is 14. My my yeah. super special They're sweet really boys. in adolescence. So one thing that you do, and we've seen this on podcast episodes, is like you kind of tease them with, with um, their Gen Z language. So you call yourself Sig Mom. I am the and Sig they Mom. Cringe. What do no, you but they mean love by now. that? They, oh, good. Like, they'll like they like. Here's a funny thing, and so many teen moms of of teens and adolescents will will agree with me. Like like they'll they'll kind of like fake like fake outrage you know what I mean like they're like ah oh, mom that's so cringe but then their friends are calling me hey sig mom and then they're like like you know that they're kind of like oh like I do actually kind of have a cool mom um and you know and I but I I, I lean into it in a way where I'm not trying to be cool like I will just be goofy and you know and I'm embracing them all like they're they're all my little booze um my kids have said you know like Try not to hug everybody so much. So if they don't want to hug, I'm not hugging them. I just want to say it's a record, you know. And and but they they all these boys call me, hey sick mom, hey sick mom. Like they text me, you know, or like one time um my son Nicholas was calling to say goodnight or something. I think I was out of town. And like three or four of them all do a little voice recording. Good night, Sig Mom. Uh, uh, right, but so wait, but for those oh, who who don't have kids this age, what mm -hmm. is Sig and where is this coming from? All right, so this was the, the the fun little thing, and maybe it existed before, and somebody, someone else was like, yeah, no, you don't make that up. What happened with us, they were all like, I'm the Sigma, you're the Sigma, and this is like, and I think there are different definitions of Sigma, but it's like the Alpha and your best friend. It's above the Alpha, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's the, it's, the head it's like, honcho, pack leader. It, it, and so, like, I'm kind of picking up what they're putting down. I'm getting a few context clues, and that's all I need. I don't need to be totally informed, just enough to be dangerous. And so then I, you know, I'm driving them around and it's like the same crew of kids. And by the way, I mean, I, here's the, here's the real secret to it all. As much as it's like talking smack and goofing off and being a little loud. I mean, these boys know I care about them deeply. I put the time on, right? And it's not like hours of gazing into their eyes, but always they come over to the house. How are you doing? Like send them a quick little text message just enough so they know, like, I'm looking out for you. And by the way, when, I mean, I have other moms doing that with my kids. It takes a village, especially with teenagers and tweens so in part I it's not a, it's like the title that makes me feel good but I have a real relationship with these boys that I've nurtured and there's been you know heartache among them and we always figure it out so it really it's at the heart of it is a relationship so but anyway so back to Sigma so they were like Sigma this Sigma that and then I was dropping them off one night at at some event at the school I'm like oh boy say goodbye to your Sigma or you know something like that like I coined it myself and then of course Nicholas was like Oh, like I'm dying. Like he's like cringe, just like disintegrating into the carpet. But the boys were like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, you know, like all the fun stuff. <laughs> and then I've just milked it. Like cause I'm shameless yeah. that way. Yeah, they like it. It's like that's that's it's it, what it is. Even if it's cringy, it's you're making connection. Right. Exactly. That's it. It's the connection. It's, it's like even just teasing. connection. Yeah. 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 And it's and saying I'm willing to make fun of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, that intention. I love that. Right. That intention so, of saying you kids matter. I'm yeah. slowing down. You need a ride. Can I do something for you? How are you doing, honey? Do you need something like like they come to our home and they are all just completely embraced with love and care. And that it's feels also really like good. you're listening. So you could just be like, I'm the best. I'm the best mom, even if you're being silly and funny. But there's something about pulling that terminology out where you're like, I'm hearing you. I hear how you talk. I hear you. And I'm being a little silly, but like I'm 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 in it with you, which I think is so fun. But um, OK, so one mom to another. What is it that you hate so much about video games? No. Oh. <laughs> Who asked that question? Oh, is that <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I know. I t we talk about this a lot. And, and honestly, uh, there was an episode that you and I had brilliant episode you did with me and Dr. Shafali. And and that was like such a crossing the river moment for me, 
right? And by the way, I feel like for all of us, we don't cross the river once. We keep crossing the river. It's, you know, different river, uh, you know, an elevated river, deeper river, wider river. And that's all part of the healing and growing journey. Um, and so for me, everything in moderation is okay. I think the problem is uh, whether it's video games or just hours of mindless scrolling, doom scrolling on their iPhones or iPads, it co- it's such an opportunity cost to, uh, you know, Alex, my younger son and I, we do our little backgammon tournaments um, on the weekends and it's like we're using our brains and we're having fun and it's in the real world. And, um, you know, and then just little dumb inside jokes emerge from that. And so to me, I don't mind if anything I'd rather have. I'm, I feel, oh, how do I say this? When I think about having two boys who are playing video games, even though they're screaming um, and, you know, a lot of times profanities and just like, I'm like, yo, yeah, like there's something to that aggression. It feels aggressive, doesn't it? Like, yeah, sometimes like, I, it just slow it down, kiddos. But I but then, you know, that's natural. I mean, um, we talked with um, Logan about that, that there's that that it's natural for them to Logan Cohen for that that to come out. And so I don't want to judge it. I want to accept it. And there, so there's a certain outlet for that. And I think that is, you know, better, honestly, for boys than a young gals who are sitting alone and, you know, comparison culture on Instagram and so forth. So I, I'm grateful for that much. And I know uh, girls and women play video games, too. So I don't want to sound too sexist over here. It's just But if we're numbers. talking about something mindless, it, it, whether it's girls or boys, just looking at what someone else has that you don't have boys do it with other things they, they they and they have it with body stuff too and and so i'm with you on that like the mindless scrolling getting you know indoctrinated with just garbage non-stop and this goes for me too i'm sure you yeah. probably feel the same way yeah it's like, at least with video games it's a goal <laughs> well yeah and then they're and they're playing you know it is social and i and so there is there are some redeeming factors but like anything in excess i mean back to addiction anything in excess is is it it takes away and that's my concern is like and we all know this they all these devices all these um video games um apps and so forth are meant to be addictive because that's you know they're all trying to make money and so when i think about both that opportunity cost in the moment geez you could go out be making cupcakes you can be out playing tennis you can be just living in the real world and enjoying your life using your body developing skills um, making memories. Um, you don't remember those hours. Ain't, you know, it's terrible for your eyes. And when I think about how sedentary it is, right? I mean, so I just, and my my younger son came to me the other day and was like, I just feel gross. I mean, and this was a day where I had a lot of work and end of summer and it was like, all right, it's hot outside, whatever. And I'm just like, I'm not fighting this fight today. Little lazy mom, I'm going to call myself out. And yep. he just like, I, don't I feel think it's gross. Lazy. You let him explore. You let him explore and find his own outcome. Well, exactly. That, true. And he was just like, I feel gross. Um, I've been doing this all day. It's boring. I feel agitated. I'm like, oh, good. And and so there was a lesson learned, except for I feel like um, it's not a terrible enough and gross enough feeling where, you know, given the chance again, I'm sure he would go, yeah, I'll spend 10 hours just mindlessly on my device. And that, you know, that's a battle that I know a lot of parents fight every day mm-hmm. yeah and i like that you gave him the chance to discover even if it was because you were busy it's going to impact him over time he is going to remember that better than all the times that we tell them like you're gonna feel gross afterward you feel like you're so aggressive so it's just I'm, I'm it's like overeating that. cheetos overeating doritos yeah. like every now oh. and then i'll take i mean cheetos no thank you doritos give me a few doritos Dor- oh like, yeah I, I, I got sick out. yum i got sick working out the other day and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I did leave the class. And I was like, oh, yeah, I ate three snack-sized bags of Doritos. They're oh. so good. <laughs> yeah. They're going kind of down. Addictive. I'm 46. Why don't I know this? But you're exactly right. We no. do have to learn it. I have to learn it once every year or two with Doritos. Yeah. I just What's do. the hard way? It's just, yeah. Wait, exactly. So, okay. This so episode do- is not brought to you by Doritos, but maybe it should no. be. I, maybe it shouldn't be because I just said I had to leave an exercise class. We love them. Class. We love them. In like, moderation. Well. Doritos in moderation. How about that? They must be so good if I'm willing to do that to myself, both of us. Okay. So speaking of your boys, on on our pod, on your podcast, you've said many times you call them your little Buddhas. 
because they teach you things that you weren't expecting to learn, even through the hard times. What has been your most humbling experience as a parent? Like what your big one? I mean, there have been a series of big ones, honestly. It's like they have caused me to see myself as a flawed human being, um, impatient, I mean, honestly, ugly, angry, um, overreactive, shouting, you know. And and by the way, I mean, sometimes they really, <laughs> they can do things that are really, really challenging. But I know as a parent, it's on me to, um, to be the the parent and to be wise and and to be patient and compassionate. I love uh, Frank Anderson. Dr. Frank always says, only engage your kids when you can do so with compassion. And I have done so out of just pure frustration and pure exhaustion. And so when I think about how they have enabled me to see myself more fully, the good news, bad news is that there have been some really like some just times where I've just felt terribly. And I've, I mean, I always make the repairs. I always do my very best to own it and apologize. And I think if they were here, they'd say, yeah, we'll, we'll co-sign on that because that's true. Even if she's, when she screws up, she really does what she can to make up for it, but you can't take it all back, right? You can't put the genie back in the bottle. And I grew up with a lot of yelling and a lot of dysfunction and so forth. And so, and um, Dr. Frank and I actually talk about this too, how common it is um, almost invariable as a parent, even when you're trying so hard, even when, I mean, for him, Harvard educated um, psychiatrist, how you're, how, how prevalent it is to repeat the patterns when, of what you experienced in growing up. So when I think about having repeated those patterns with so much guilt and remorse, it's been so motivating to me to say, um, let me, let me do what I need to do to really become whole as a human being, you know, and with my role as mom at the top, because like when I think about how I want um, to be truly the best mom that I can to these sweet, amazing boys, like that is very motivating to me. And so it's been the, I mean, so like a lot of things, it got bad and not like the heartache, the feeling of, oh, golly, like, mm, like just painful was motive, like that motivating to me to make change but that's often what it takes is it has to be uncomfortable enough just you know like we were talking about if you if you feel uncomfortable and gross enough after playing 12 hours of video games well then maybe you'll change so that's why they're my my buddhas i saw something on instagram and i wish i'd I, no i sent it to you actually on instagram i know you're you don't look at your dms enough but it no, was something like <laughs> it was something like we were not designed to break every generational legacy that's been going for hundreds and hundreds of years. And for you and me, once again, those AAA Aries, we can't just break a few of that, of those, those legacies. We're going to break all of them. They're going to, they're all going to get broken. And these children are going to go out in the world and they're going to be the healthiest human beings that ever lived because that's how we do things. Right. And I thought, oh my gosh, I could totally see in this way too, it's almost self-sabotage because we got to break all those generational traumas. And I don't know that our parents ever thought I've got to break a family tradition of a generational trauma or I've got to do something totally different than my parents did. I know my mom made an effort in a way to do that, but it wasn't, We no one thought about it that way. No one thought about that way. No one thought, no one thought about it that way before. So not only are we trying to break these traditions, we're doing something no one's ever done, at least not in our sort of American Western culture, right? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I, I, that's hilarious to think about. I hadn't really thought about that framing. Like I'm over here. I mean, my dad and I joke because for me, there's very little in moderation, even though I'm like, hey, kids, watch video games in moderation. For me, it's like everything is almost an extreme, but I'm getting better there. But totally, right? So when it comes to my healing journey, and I think for you too, it's like we're trying, it's like it becomes that much more intensive. It's like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I've set my sights on. And then because I'm so self-critical and I'm so freaking hard on myself, and I know you are too, Joanna, that it then becomes when I screw up, it's like, oh my gosh, that feeling of self-condemnation and self-sabotage, it's real. But that that's where the ninja move comes in and I'm no joke coming back to these deep meditations where I've gotten so much better at giving myself grace, being more patient and compassionate because 
what we are handed as human beings, listen, some people, life's a little bit easier for them. And hallelujah for you people. God bless you. I hope you're doing beautiful things in your life. For the vast majority of us, there have been wounds and so much heartache, addiction, trauma, um, abuse, you name it, handed down um, that that we most of us spend a lifetime either trying to heal from or or running from right and then that to me that becomes the addict addict a kind of dead end for addicts if you're trying to outrun it and you don't face it that probably i mean and again i've i've experienced um i mean not personally personally but close to relatives where if they didn't address it typically it ended very 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 badly so all it's we can also do is the beginning of the addiction you know, Jessica Leahy's research has been saying, like, the best way to inoculate your child against addiction is to teach them how to manage stress and face their traumas and their fears up front. Mm-hmm. That's Amen. the best way to yeah, inoculate to talk them about against what's un- addiction. Yeah, they don't have about, to run from it. Totally. Talk so, about what's uncomfortable, be accountable. You know, like a lot of those things that we didn't, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming based on our many conversations, the things that we didn't experience i mean there'll be certain degrees of accountability but a lot of times there isn't accountability in terms of how our parents or caregivers behaved and that's i think the game changer for us as as our you know for like okay the as terry real and bruce springsteen say like the the fame the flame stops with me and that i think is something that i'm really proud of and i know you are too because we do that hard work because it, it does make a difference in our lives and the lives of our kids so since we were just talking about your podcast, have you had a guest who has really challenged you? Like one that was extra hard? Yeah. Hmm. Not um, me. I was no, the first well, guest, by the way, for listeners. You, be my, I was be, the first guest. Yeah, wonderful <laughs> host and and uh, uh, guest. You know, well, I I guess I I'm gonna say no because it's not a it's not a guest job to challenge me. Right. I mean, they're they're on to to, uh, you know, answer my questions versus like, well, Andrea, well, like, mm. um, I mean, there have been a couple of guests that I feel like have been challenging in the sense they're really smart, and really caring. And they're going on and on and on. I'm having a hard time as a host, like reeling them in. You know, and I'm like, oh, I can't do my job because I'm you. This is like a wall of words coming at me. But that that's the guests. I mean, that's not their fault. That's that's on me to figure out. But I don't feel like there's been anybody, you know, some people that I disagreed with, but I honestly, I feel like there's been nothing where I'm like, I, I mean, like that was hard. I feel like the, I mean, let me actually turn the round, that around and say, I feel like there have been a whole host. I mean, honestly, like dozens of times where I'm like, oh my God, that is the message I needed right now. Yes. So maybe challenging in terms of like challenging me to think differently, to look yeah. at myself. I mean, and that's the whole point of the show. That well, getting Shefali, open. really. Oh, Shafali was, was the like, big one. Andrea, your kids do not have to go to the best college. She just said it right to your face. And I could see your fear in the moment if people watch that episode. It's such a good episode. You can see your brain being like, but wait, wait, wait. Yes, they do. And she's like, no, you don't. <laughs> but yeah. wait, 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 wait. They could. Why wouldn't they? But they don't have to. Like, that was such a great moment. I loved that moment. Well, and just like why, you know, like, like just like basically telling me to back off. And she was so right. She's brilliant. And I love her. And there have been a handful of those other kinds of experiences. And again, that's the whole the whole freaking point of the show is to challenge each other in these conversations, see our blind spots. It's like I am so sure that I am right. And then I have these wonderful guests on and, you know, comments that you've made and so forth that have helped me see blind spots and and reframe beliefs or revisit beliefs that I was so sure were accurate. And it's like, you know what? Um, Let me free myself from these these things that I feel like are absolute truths in a way that can um, lead to my just showing up in a way that's more open to other people. And and all that has been really helpful. And ultimately, I know and it's probably really good for the audience to know that when you were conceiving of this podcast, a big thing you wanted to do was make it so that people could talk about things that feel off limits, whether it's from themselves or or even politically or just an opinion, an, an unpopular opinion, which has such a bad use connotation now. But I know that was a mission for you was let's figure out how to talk about the things that are off limits. And 
you have done that by doing that for you. Like Shafali saying to you, this thing you've always believed was important is not as important as you think it is. I mean, that is an uncomfortable conversation. And yet we had it. And Shafali did that to me too with the question I asked her. I had to have oh, a yeah. conversation. That was awesome. And face was something. Like, Got it. Yeah. Oh yeah. She knew instantly she read me for filth in the most therapeutically sound way possible. <laughs> so anyway, is there... Is there any area in which you really want to dive in the future of this podcast? Just in just to quickly sum up, where do you want to go with it in your dreams? And who do you want to really reach with it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, in my dreams that it we continue to have conversations with extraordinary people that are are really open, that that people that people listening and watching have the same kind of experience that you and I have. It's like they're, you know, their defenses have been pierced in a way that is so freeing and so liberating and that the things that I'm saying work for me or our guests or, you know, when when you're hosting the show or whatever, that they go, oh, maybe that is for me because I was so convinced it wasn't for me. I was so convinced that person was a jerk. I was so convinced it was everybody else that was wrong. Right. And then you go, oh, maybe it is me. And I've had that experience so many times in the most beautiful way. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, frick. You know, and I love. And then who would be your, you know, who be your number one dream guest? I know there's a lot, but just quick, just quick. Who goes oh. to your head first? Oh my gosh, um, Taylor Swift. Okay, good. I <laughs> like, love that. You know, I mean, when I think about somebody who, I, I mean, literally with that song, "I'm the Problem, It's Me," I've I've referenced this song a few times, and I kind of smile and like make a joke out of it. But when I think about her courage and in so much of what she's done, I mean, she is brilliant. She has helped so many people. And she tells these truths about herself in a way that makes it safe for other people to see themselves more fully, to see their pettiness, to see their their um, their mistakes, their flaws. And, you know, to me, like that is the ultimate act of service. And by the way, she's having a kick ass time looking glam. Oh, my God. Yeah. Living her best life. Like, I'm like, you yes. go, girl. We're putting it out there into the universe. Taylor yeah, Swift, Taylor, getting open. Andrea when you get Miller. a free minutes, love to have you on the show. <laughs> and that, you know, and that ultimately, when I think about people listening and watching, that feeling of transformation that happens, if there's probably one thing that I'm most proud of that the show has done that I've experienced, I've heard it from many guests. I know, Joanna, in, in many of the episodes you've done with me, we will will confab at the end about how we just felt that shift. And you can see it in our guests' eyes and in their body language where a something has happened they've become more open and it there's nothing like it i mean that feeling of there's an openness now now change is possible right because if you're closed forget it nothing nothing can happen i mean if you're closed you can have a nice conversation you can be entertained but if you're closed change cannot happen and the only way we can transform and heal and grow and thrive is if we change and change is uncomfortable so it keeps coming you know it's like either a vicious negative cycle or it's a virtu virtuous positive cycle but that feeling of change it can only come from within nobody can do it for us and that feeling of having these conversations where there's like ding ding you know whether it's Shafali calling me or you out or anybody else where it's like oh yeah that now my heart's open now my mind's open okay let's go so that that's the goal and um i'm so grateful joanna to you for being on close to 50 episodes with me <laughs> and and Brian and Lily and Dane and um, so many others, Sabrina, of course, so many others who have um, um, helped me give birth to this beautiful, extraordinary show that I'm so proud of. That's only getting better. And I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap. Yeah, that's a wrap. I'm so glad we got to talk about this. And, and you know, some of these reviewer questions, but some of them were my questions. I think we all know that now. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, this has been Another, uh, I hope, um, uh, kind of inspiring, interesting episode of Getting Open. Um, if you are into what we're talking about, please like the show, follow, subscribe. We are bringing our whole hearts uh, to make the show for you. And we would just be so grateful for your support. And that's a wrap. We'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>